Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our community conversation in December of 2020. This month, USITT is focus, focusing on professionals in management. I'm your host, Lawrence Larry Bennett. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm calling in from the ancestral lands of the Miami, uh, Osage, and Ilane people, also known as St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, we have an amazing group of panelists here to speak with you today, and I'm in awe to spend time and share this space with them and to tell us a little bit about themselves and their experiences. So with that, we will begin with a roundtable introduction, beginning with Danielle. Hi, my name is Danielle D.T. Daniels, um, she, her pronouns, and I am the resident stage manager at Baltimore Center Stage. Excellent. David? Hey, everybody. I'm D. Stu. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, his, and I am calling from the stolen land of the Seminole people. Brian. Hi, everyone. I am Brian White. I'm the director of production at Dallas Theater Center. My pronouns are he, him, and it's great to be with you all this afternoon. Excellent. Shannon. Good afternoon. I'm Shannon Pringle. I'm the production manager for California State University's Summer Arts Program. Uh, she, her pronouns, and I am coming to you from Southern California. Excellent. And Cody. Hey everybody, I am Cody Nard Richard. I am a stage manager, uh, primarily working in New York City, and I'm calling from New York City. Excellent. Uh, we do have one more panelist who will be joining us in just a moment. Their internet connection is uh, being not so friendly. So as soon as they join us, we will introduce them currently. Uh, but one thing I would love to start this conversation with out with is getting to know a little bit more about the panelists in your journey. So if you can tell us a little bit about uh, a project you're currently working on in your organization or where you are in your organization and your journey to get to where you are currently. Uh, and with that, let's start with Shannon. Hi, well, uh, California State University Summer Arts is an arts and academic program um, in the summertime. And um, wow, I've been here for about 20 years, a little bit more than 20 years. And we offer classes in the arts, all different sectors of the arts. Where we are today, um, well, we did have to cancel our 2020 season. Um, we are currently planning our 2021 season. Um, and we have been creating and inventing all different kinds of things to you know, help students be able to tap their art in this new environment. Uh, at this time. Excellent. Thank you very much. And we, while we have a sec, I would like to go ahead and introduce Akim, who uh, is our last panelist, and give him an opportunity to introduce himself. Welcome, Akim. Well, looks like we might have a little more troubleshooting to do, so we will go ahead and continue moving forward. Uh, Brian, tell us a little bit about your journey and what you are working on currently. Yeah, so I um, I joined the team at Dallas Theater Center um, the day before the theater completely shut down for the pandemic. I was living in Miami um, and was was going to be flying out to meet with the interim director of production and got a call saying, don't get on that plane tomorrow because we're shutting down. So I actually spent the first three months in my current position remotely managing um, with an hour time zone difference, which you wouldn't think would be a big deal, but actually is um, quite annoying. Um, and so it's been a really interesting, challenging, and exciting year. Uh, Dallas Theater Center as a regional theater, obviously uh, nonprofit. We are purely driven by the support and generosity of our, our board and our donors um, as a result of a really aggressive board and really phenomenal donors. We actually managed not to lay off any of our staff, including our entire production staff. We managed to not furlough any of our staff. We managed to not reduce anyone's salaries. Um, and that's really allowed us to uh, keep producing in whatever ways that we've been able to. So we just uh, did a filmed version, a new adaptation of our Christmas Carol. Uh, we're in the process now of doing two sort of performance art derived pieces that are gonna be outdoor works um, and really hoping to be able to have some limited return with live audiences in the spring. So. It's been a challenging year, but we've we've learned a lot. I personally have learned a lot about myself as a manager and as a leader, um, and we're really excited to see what's next. 
Excellent. You know, I would love to hear a little bit more about uh, when you began your job at Dallas Theater Center and how you were working remote uh, and, and, and getting everything you need to start a new job when you weren't on the job. Like, how was that experience for you? It was it was tough. I think the thing that was um, the most challenging for me was uh, not having points of reference. You know, obviously we're in a lot of different planning conversations and every iteration of season planning and scenario planning. Um, and everybody's got common points of reference of if we do this over in this building and that and this, and I don't know all of those things. So what it forced me to do was really rely very heavily on my department heads um, that report up to me um, to trust their knowledge and trust that they know what they're talking about. They know what they're doing. They know what the resources are. Um, and that was that was really um, a, a, a pivot in thinking that I had to to take. Um, and and other than that, I think that the the big lesson that I I took out of that moment of you know having to lead remotely and manage remotely and interface with all these folks remotely um, was just the importance of clear and concise communication, whether that's text or email or phone or video, whatever medium we're going to use. Uh, the clarity of communication um, became so important because everything's urgent, everything's the most important thing all the time, but you've just got to get really clear about what we're trying to address. Wow, that sounds like an excellent challenge and, and kudos to you for surviving that, it's, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, Dee, why don't you tell us a little bit about your journey and how you're making art in this pandemic? Uh, journey right now is, well, we were ready to jump right into rehearsal and then the pandemic hit, but also while the pandemic hit very hard, I was six months pregnant. So as we were going further along into this journey, while I was so lucky to be able to have my beautiful daughter, Tegan, um, at the same time, while I'm still waiting for the theater to be able to produce and us returning back to the theater, I'm taking a lot of my time really trying to find the ins and outs of all the streaming methods um, that we'll be able to use in the future because it's going to be a bigger part of our future and also mentoring students um, who are curious about stage management but aren't able to start it right now so they're very preemptively learning from me how to prepare for rehearsals um, once we get back to old school but also how they can prep themselves for zoom rehearsals leading into our future Excellent. You know, I would love to hear more about you being a new mother and how that has been dovetailing into uh, your work in a theater, as we know, it's traditionally not very welcoming to parents in general. But do you see a swing happening uh, where they're being more inclusive as uh, with folks with children? Well, I see now that we're in this world where we're in a rehearsal process where we're not really working ourselves into six days a week where we're trying to cram everything into there, but actually being a little bit more kind, trying to establish a five day rehearsal period. I'm very excited to see where that goes, but also um, I'm curious to see how my daughter is gonna be able to intertwine because I wasn't necessarily a theater kid, but I'm very curious to see how being able to blend that family life as it is now with having rehearsals um, and telling her to be very quiet at the interim, but also she's kind of learning to be quiet at certain times because her curiosity is peaked with the arch as well it should be. So start them young. Excellent, excellent. Uh, David Stewart, can you give us a little bit about your background and journey and how you're producing art in this pandemic? A little bit about, uh, I guess I should say where I work. Uh, I'm a production manager for the Walt Disney Company and I uh, have been here for two years. And um, I think pretty much everyone knows that we had to shut down our parks globally during the pandemic starting in March and we were able to reopen most of our parks um, a few months ago. And producing art has been an interesting thing for us to do and how we reimagine bringing our, our characters, our, our fan favorites back to um, our guests. Uh, so there's a lot of distancing, um, a lot of cavalcades, meaning we put a lot of our characters into cars and, and um, have them go around the park so that our guests can still see our princesses and Minnie and Mickey. Um, I, opened a show yesterday at Chef Mickey's, which is at one of our um, one of our resorts, and doing a lot of uh, spacing and having, it's very interesting having safety professionals on board and, and watching us and walking around with tape measures, making sure that we're plenty of distance away from our guests. Um, and we're fortunate enough to have a broadcast company with us. And so um, a couple of different projects that I've been working on to bring virtually was, number one was the National Association of Black Journalists 
and the National Association for Hispanic Journalists. And usually that convention uh, takes place in person. Uh, last year it was in Miami. This year it was supposed to be in DC. Uh, and we had to present that virtually. And so that was an interesting challenge trying to learn how to do things in terms of broadcast. And the other one, the another project that I, I closed out that I was the production manager for was uh, bringing back the NBA to the United States as well as interleague soccer and being part of uh, the entertainment package behind that and making sure we were able to deliver um, one of America's favorite uh, sports back to the United States. And so it's been a challenge, but um, we are fortunate that we have uh, good resources to be able to bring entertainment back to the masses. Wow, that's that, that's excellent. Sounds like a lot. You know, one thing I would love to hear about is uh, a company as big as Disney and with the new enhanced safety protocols. Um, how hard was how hard was it to pivot uh, to get on this, this new uh, process and procedures to make sure that everyone's following these new uh, COVID safety protocols? Well, I, I think one of the, the great things about Disney is that we're Disney. So we're also a private entity. So when people come onto our campus, we get to dictate and say how people are going to uh, participate in the magic that we produce. So had I known that plexiglass was going to be a thing and going to be all over Disney, I would have invested in plexiglass companies a long time ago. <laughs> so uh, there is uh, a lot of, uh, of those things that we put into place and, and trying to make it fun. And... Um, again, it's it's really kind of having the might of Disney to say, hey, if you want to be here, we're going to have to play by a different set of rules. And people seem to be on board for that. Um, it, when we first opened the parks, I was fortunate enough to be part of one of the, the test teams that went into the parks to see how things were going to operate to help our operations folks uh, learn to their uh, adjust to their new reality with masks and face shields. Um, and I have to say that I felt safer going into the parks and going shopping at Target. So uh, I think our teams have done an amazing, amazing job of taking safety and science seriously and applying it to entertainment. Excellent. Excellent. You guys are doing some fantastic work over there. So thank you very much for that. Uh, Cody, Thanks. tell us a little bit about <laughs> a little bit about yourself and your journey and uh, how you're producing art in this pandemic. <sighs> Yeah, um, I am originally from Houston, Texas. I've been in New York for about uh, 10 years now. Um, and I primarily went on Broadway. When the shutdown happened, I was doing a workshop for Disney, uh, which we didn't finish. Um, and throughout the pandemic, you know, I've, I've been fortunate enough to do a couple of events in person, which has been um, nice, but also uh, different, uh, given all the, the circumstances with COVID and whatnot. Um, and in addition to being a stage manager, I'm also an educator. I teach at NYU in Columbia, and I just recently founded um, a scholarship program with uh, we're at Coalition. Um, so that's kind of a little bit about my journey and what I've been up to. Excellent. You know, as, as Broadway has been hit very hard by this pandemic, are you seeing any um, uh, pushback, well, not pushback, excuse me, but any um, uh, safety enhancement protocols happening to be able to reopen our stages here in the near future? I mean, yeah, all very practical things uh, just with, uh, you know, there's been the role of the COVID compliance officer that has been created in most, most if not all um, uh, things that happen in person uh, engages with that, that officer who makes sure that, you know, people are staying six feet apart, they do zoning things. So, you know, if you're in a certain zone, you can only be within a certain feet of the, the stage. You know, we wear masks all the time. If you're around someone who's not wearing masks, it's, you know, you're, you have to wear a shield. Uh, so there's all these uh, COVID protocols, um, which is helpful for the meantime, um, which I can only imagine will probably carry over into um, our normal world once we begin to, to see theater come back. Excellent, excellent. Thank you all for for your stories. As as we are all witnessing, there's a, a, a lot and a variety of ways that this pandemic has hit all of us in the arts and entertainment industry and seeing how you all are uh, surviving and thriving and or trying to plan for the return of some of our great art institutions is, is phenomenal work. So thank you for all that you are doing and all that you will be doing in the future. Uh, so I want to use that to dovetail into our next question, which is, what do you see as the biggest um, issue facing our industry today, I would say pandemic aside? Um, I'd have to say transparency and the continuous to be able to be flexible with change, just because, you know, being in the um, 
a regional theater now, things are ever changing. We're always hearing different things that are going to be happening next and happening next and happening next. And center stage is my home. So it, without feeling like I have to sit down and twiddle my thumbs, it's nice to have the transparency, but at the same time, be ready to go, be ready to understand that work is going to happen at some point and continuing to constantly educate myself, not just about COVID restrictions, but being able to, as I mentioned before, be able to navigate around these Zoom platforms, these other streaming platforms so that, you know, people, some people are under the impression that education stops. Education is forever going, forever changing, forever mutating, forever forming, forever morphing. So I have to say, being able to not just sit and go, well, I wonder when opportunity is going to come. No, opportunity comes when you create it for yourself and educate yourself so that you're not just educating yourself and making yourself more of an asset to those that are looking for people that know what they're doing. You know, in terms of transparency, what does that look like to you uh, as you start to get your journey of, uh, of getting back to uh, some sense of normalcy? Like, what would you like to see in that, in that realm? Um, I, I guess more on transparency, it's the same thing that we want is just to be informed of what's happening to be, I guess, the most realist, the realist answer you can possibly give someone. But sometimes just having that real answer just means having to wait because people aren't obeying protocols. People aren't doing what it actually takes for you to be able to return to the world. So again, it just feels like you're constantly on the trigger without feeling like you're a ball of nerves. Like you just have to trust in the process that's happening and hope that just got to have hope, you know, unfortunately, but fortunately, the arts is such a wonderful thing to take part of, but it's not the most profitable one. So, you know, you either have to find a way to make your grain and be patient, or unfortunately, and what a lot of people have had to do is leave the industry leave the industry to try to find other means of income. So right now I have my other means, but I still want to hold on to my artistic dream because I worked very hard for it. I mean, as young as I look, I've been doing this for 20 years and it's not something I'm going to give up because times are hard. That's that's the epitome of our work is to be able to entertain when times are hard and to give to the audiences because right now that's what we need. People don't realize how much art is in their lives. When you listen to the radio, when you watch TV, when you're interacting with people, that's be, that stems from art. That That's what gives birth to art. Like we aren't, they're reading books, listening to music. It's no one, I guess a lot of people take for granted what arts means to other people, but it's something that you give and it's constantly morphing and it's on so many different platforms that it's always engaging and helpful for people to realize that art is ever present, art is ever changing, and it gives you so much warmth and comfort to know that there is something coming. Our normal, as Cody has said before, is coming. It's gonna be different, but it's so appreciative to realize that I did dedicate my time to this and I'm not gonna give up. This is very well said. Stuart? Um, yeah, I would say that our biggest challenge is, and I'm gonna push back a little bit, that is not going back to normal. Uh, during this time of the great pause, I think that we have been um, afforded an opportunity as organizations to reflect on where we are, especially around issues of equity, diversity, and inclusion. And one of the big things that I was concerned about when this pandemic first hit um, was that organizations, in order to get back up on their feet, would be concerned about making that almighty dollar to get themselves back up and running again. And my fear is, is that uh, theaters would start going back to their the the old canon bringing back the old tired things that uh they feel make money and bringing back the, the same creatives to do that work and that uh equity diversity and inclusion would be considered an afterthought and a nice to have rather than an imperative which is where i thought we were we were heading and then came along um the murder of george floyd and uh, Black Lives Matter 2.0, and uh, that became very apparent with that we can't go back to normal, that we actually need to change our, our mindset when it comes to our predominantly white theaters, and that we have to um, uh, 
stand up and take note, kind of like with what uh, we see white American theater is doing and uh, issuing their uh, 29 pages of, you can call them demands, suggestions, a roadmap. But I think they offer up a lot of things that organizations can do so that we don't go back to normal, so that we can make progress, so that um, uh, we're not looking at just who's in on stage or in front of the camera, but who's backstage and who's producing the work and who are the world builders and the influencers and the leaders. And I think that we have to to not go back to the way things were, but we actually need to progress forward. 100% agreed with that. You know, there's a lot of realities that we were doing in the theater that we did because no one ever challenged that mantra. No one ever challenged why we were doing the things that we were doing. And in this moment of great pause, as you so eloquently stated, uh, is an opportunity to make sure that we center the human uh, in our humanity. And as we get back to work, make sure that we don't lose that aspect. I agree with you that uh, once we get back to business as usual, that the the dollar is going to be centered and how do we recoup the losses uh from the pandemic and and edie and i and the humanity will take a back seat and so I, I very much echo what you're saying and hopefully that the industry leaders are hearing uh and not going down that road uh brian what do you think is the biggest issue facing our industry yeah i i think i would amplify that a little further and and I would hone in on the sustainability of it. Um, you know, right now we're at DTC, for example, rethinking our producing model. And one of the things that we're contemplating is this idea of bringing everything in house. So all of the actors using a resident acting company, all of the designers using resident designers, all of the directors using resident directors. Well, while that's addressing an economic challenge, right? An economic reality and how we have to produce, what is that actually going to do on the from the EDI standpoint? Um, are we going to have representative teams that we're actually going to be advancing a lot of the challenges and issues that we've been looking at? So while we've had this fantastic pause and folks have had the time to do the work, that's great. But when we are pivoting into new economic realities, when we're pivoting into new producing realities, and that time goes away, or that what is perceived as excess time goes away, how is that actually gonna impact the, the quality of the EDI work that we're doing? So I amplify those same sim sentiments to say the sustainability of the focus on the work that's being done now is my real Excellent, real concern, very well said real also. Uh, does anyone else have anything they would like to add to the biggest in uh, issue facing our industry? Sure, I, oh, Shannon, do you wanna go? Oh, um, I'll just say, first of all, I have to come back to what you said, Larry, about centering the human. I think that is so important. I say it all the time. It's about the people, not the product. And we forget that a lot of times when, you know, when finances and revenue comes into play. So I think it's important to continue to talk about centering the humans. Um, and the other thing that, that, that I think is important to talk about is that, you know, accountability looks different for everyone. And we have to, as we move forward, the conversations that we've had, we have to uh, figure out what accountability means for each of us and how, what our responsibility is in that and holding people accountable and holding ourselves accountable to remember to continue to do this work, this EDI work and this anti-racism work when we're back to, to actually pounding the pavement and trying to look for a gig or, or even on the gig. So I think it's a, a, a big issue that will face our industry and that is currently facing our industry is remembering to stay accountable and to hold folks accountable and to remember that looks different for other people. So you have to define it for yourself and figure out how, you know, you can affect that change. Very well said. I agree with that. Accountability does look different depending on who you are and where you are and what you're doing. But holding people accountable nonetheless is very important. So thank you for that. Shannon. You know, I think we're all on the same page on this. You know, we might be saying it a little bit differently, but, you know, all of us want to feel safe. We want to feel safe emotionally. We want to feel safe physically. You know, as it comes to COVID, you know, or anything else, we want to do things on stage safely uh, so that, you know, people are going to be okay and that they can show up for work and to feel that their organization is taking care of them. And we want to feel safe emotionally as well. We want to be able to speak our mind at our organization and, and um, 
feel that our feelings and our humanity, as was said before, is being respected. So everyone wants to Excellent, say. excellent. Uh, and with that, I want to pivot just a little bit. Uh, you know, as we are in this great moment of change, as we're in this great moment of reflection and pause, you know, as we are dealing with the pandemic, uh, with job losses and or furloughs, with reimagining what the American theater looks like on, you know, any level that you're producing on. Uh, one thing I would like to pose to the group is what brings you joy? What brings what gets you out of the bed in the morning? Uh, I think. I actually experienced it yesterday. It's one of those things where sometimes when I forget what, you know, why I do what I do is to uh, go into the parks and, and see the joy that's on other people's faces. And yesterday uh, when we were putting up Chef Mickey and um, I was watching us get, get that show going on and Minnie's walking through and waving to all our guests that were in the restaurant. And there was this little girl in her princess dress. She must have been mm, five or six years old and just could not get Minnie's attention. Waving, waving, yelling, yelling, and Minnie's doing her thing, waving to everybody. And then one of our uh, cast members went in and tapped Minnie on the shoulder and said, hey, there's a, you have a friend over here. And she turned around and just totally focused in on this little girl. And you just watched her face light up and just so much joy radiate through her body and that there was no pandemic. There was no badness in the world. There was just joy. She was witnessing one of her favorite characters in life, paying attention to her, blowing her kisses, getting kisses back from her and just eating it up. And um, that, that brings me joy. Just that we have that kind of profound effect from two to 102. And uh, I think it is a, a timeless joy that we bring. There's nothing like Disney magic. I will say that. <laughs> Um, for me recently, like I'll have to admit, not being able to work for a couple of months, it did sort of mess with my head a little bit. Um, I was really fortunate that a lighting designer I worked with before, he has a stage management class and I was able to speak to that class. And one of the students reached out to me and she said she wanted to talk more about stage management and delving into that. And my mother, my grandmother was a teacher. My mother's a teacher. And they're like, you're going to be a teacher one day. And I was like, nah, I don't want to do that. Um, but now I'm actually mentoring a young woman. Um, and what gives me joy is every week we just take a simple hour just to talk about whatever she wants to in terms of stage management and me being able to still share my craft, even though I'm not able to do my passion. It gives me such pleasure to know that she thinks what's coming out of my brain, what's coming out of my heart, what's coming out of my mouth is so helpful for her in the future. And each time I meet with her, I realize that I'm still able to do my job. I'm still able to help someone I'm still able to do some sort of production and be able to give that to her and being able to pass my knowledge on to someone else that's that gives me a, a highlight every Wednesday every hour it just I can't explain it it's, it feels good to be able to educate someone and know that what I'm saying she's going to take with her and she's going to be an even better stage manager than she thinks she is excellent excellent Cody go ahead Oh, I was gonna say, I love that. I love, I, I think the next generation, the people coming after us are so inspiring. Um, but I have a slightly different answer. I bring myself joy. I live alone in Harlem <laughs> and, and get out of bed sometimes it is hard. So I have to bring myself joy. I find things around this little apartment that makes me happy. And, and that is a part of self care. And I urge everyone to find those things, go for a walk, paint your nails, cook something, watch a tea. Like I'm telling you, I have to bring my own joy because if not, it will not be as bright and, and yellow in this apartment. So um, that's that's my answer for today. You know, as someone who, who's known Cody a great many years uh, and who follows him on social media, he is not short for joy. Uh, and just watching him live his best life uh, and the survive and thrive in his pandemic and in his career is, is a, a sight to see. So uh, he brings that joy and he's an excellent person definitely to get to know and to be around. So uh, not surprised in the least, Cody. <laughs> Shannon. <laughs> I'm brought joy by hearing these stories from all of these other panelists. This is fantastic. I am so inspired by my colleagues. 
um, because we are charged with making things happen and helping to support these artists who want to do these amazing things and finding the time to make it happen and to be creative about it and to be smart about it. Um, so, you know, you all bring me a lot of joy because I'm inspired and, you know, steal some of your ideas and say, wow, we could try that. Wouldn't that be really cool? And, you know, hey, have you thought about this? And uh, that's, that's wonderful. Thank you. Excellent. Brian. It's hard to follow all that joy. Um, I would say for me, you know, it really, I, I, I love clearing obstacles for people. I, I think there's a tremendous trust that's placed in those in these leadership positions, particularly in the regional theater, where we are able to have a very direct impact on the lives and the work of the folks that we are working with. And I, there's nothing I love more than solving a good puzzle and being able to go to a problem, get underneath the problem and figure out what's the root cause, right? We're not just slapping band-aids on stuff, but really understanding what are the institutional pressures? What are the economic pressures? What are the models that are leading to a lot of these major issues that we're dealing with in all of our various organizations? Um, and, and, and understanding those challenges in a really resonant way and then deconstructing them, taking them completely apart um, and finding those long-term sustainable solutions. So whenever I'm able to have one of those breakthrough moments or to help someone else with one of their breakthrough moments, that's even more exciting to be able to enable someone else to get past an obstacle, to get past a major rock that they're encountering in their work, because that's what makes our entire ecosystem working in live theater and in live entertainment, that's what makes our ecosystem healthier. So for me, solving the problems is what's bringing me the joy. Excellent, excellent. Um, we have reached the point- Oh, in, Larry, one more thing, oh, sorry. Yes, please. Beating Larry at night. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't played Matt in years, but he is correct. He, I believe the last few times we played, I, I did in fact lose, but uh, that is short lived, sir. Short lived. Um, I am going to uh, throw the pen as a bit of a curveball. This is something where I am going to go a bit off script, uh, but I wanted to see how they think on their feet. So one question I have for the panelists is give, uh, give me something, a fun fact about yourself that most people don't know about you. So one fun fact that uh, most people don't know about you. We will start with Shannon. Oh, that one's tough. Um, yeah, I, I like a really good fourth grade joke, you know, the really clean jokes. Although I think people know that about me. I just, you know, yeah, I, I, I like the, those kinds of things. <laughs> Stuart. Mm, you did really kind of throw a curveball out there. <laughs> uh, my nickname is, my original nickname is actually not David uh, D. Stu. It's actually Tiger. That was given to me by one of my aunties from Louisiana. And, yes, exactly right. Um, <laughs> and so anytime my dad said, David, I knew it was not a good sign. Anytime <laughs> Tiger came out of my dad's mouth, all good. But David came out, yeah, it was lights out. Fair enough. <laughs> Denia. It's, I guess it's a pet peeve, but it's actually a really funny thing that my husband realizes about me. I can't do anything unless it ends with a zero and a five. So if you tell me that I'm supposed to be someplace at 501, I'll get there at five o'clock. Or if we have to leave the house and it's 537 and we have to leave at five, we have to leave at 540. I just, it, you can't, you can't just, it, no, it's got to end in a five, a zero or five. It's, That's stage manager. It's, yeah. yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And we're going to be late. No, no, just, just two minutes. It's two minutes. Brian. Um, mine's all about self-care actually. So something people don't know about me is every single night, and I am not exaggerating, I pour myself the hottest bubble bath you could imagine, and the biggest glass of red wine you can imagine, and I soak and listen to a podcast for an hour and a half before bed. Every single night, I don't miss it. 
My husband knows, don't bother me, don't talk to me, don't even <laughs> think about me during this time. It's my time, taking it back, reclaiming my time, and that's how I, I relax. Excellent, excellent, I'm jealous. Cody. <laughs> I was trying to think of something outrageous because so many stories came to mind. <laughs> And I'm just going to say, I guess a fun fact, <laughs> so I won't go there, but a fun fact about me is that I really, really love country music. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. You all did well uh, for the curveball. I wanted to see how you all thought on your feet as managers in this field. One of the perks of the job, right, is being able to come up with a solution on the spot and, and execute. So bravo, bravo. Uh, so back to our regularly scheduled program. Uh, a lot of you have a lot of different experiences in the academic world, in the uh, regional world, in the Broadway world, in cruise ships, et cetera. What do you see as the biggest difference between each of those uh, industries as it relates to your specific job title, whether you're a production manager or a stage manager? What would you uh, count as the biggest differences between you know, academic theater, uh, regional theater, um, Broadway, cruise ships, et cetera? Start, go ahead, Dee. Um, I was actually going to say the level of, um, I don't want to say making a mistake because there's no such thing as making mistakes because we're constantly learning. So I feel like having, having PA, PA to bit of Broadway shows, but also working off, 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 off Broadway and also working in regional theater, I have to say probably regional theater is my favorite because it gives you the opportunity to have internships gives you an opportunity to constantly learn without feeling like you're making a mistake, but also helping you grow because someone is also, no matter what you're constant, no matter what you're doing, someone is constantly watching you. And I just feel like in regional theater, you're, you're able to be more one-on-one -on -one and give someone a more directness of what you think their skills are and how you feel like they're advancing. So I guess it's more of the interaction and the ability of having a tighter education in terms a regional theater, just because I feel off Broadway and Broadway, we're very much on the go. You're constantly moving. So you're just hoping that someone sees you as opposed to telling you like, you could be doing this to advance more. Understood. David. Um, he, I think that uh, they all hold something very unique. I loved when I was teaching at the university, um, despite teaching you. Uh, that was, you know, <laughs> the dark, those were dark days. Um, but no, I, I loved working with students. Obviously, Larry, you and I, our, our friendship is rooted in the academy. Um, and I loved uh, being a mentor and teaching young people about our craft. Um, I loved working at the Guthrie. I loved being an executive there and being able to actually adjust policy and have it uh, be implemented quickly. I remember being sitting in Joe Hodge's office and going, this is what I want to do to the job descriptions. I want to take out all the educational requirements and do this. He's like, go check with HR to make sure it's not illegal and go do it. I'm like, wow, I was so used to the, the machinations of the academy of having to be somebody, you know, some tenured professor's idea to get it moved through. Uh, and then there's Disney where it's like, okay, um, we have lots of resources. We have the, the ability to do things, but my influence is very, um, it becomes very team focused right now as a production manager. I, I focus primarily on the budgets, um, but still the, just to be able to kind of bring uh, influence to a, a smaller section and bring it to my team. I had a, an executive uh, producer come up to me yesterday and go, hey, I love how you set up production meetings and how you run them. Uh, that should be the standard for Disney. And I'm like, oh, how come Disney hasn't figured out how to run a really efficient production meeting? That's not rocket science, but uh, so I think they just offer very, very different things. And I'm glad that I've been able to explore those things. Excellent, excellent, very well said. Uh, Brian. I think in my experience, you know, uh, resource availability and um, how you Lever how you're expected to leverage those resources and how you can smartly leverage those resources is probably one of the biggest differences that I've observed. Um, and I think the thing that's good about that is it forces you to tap into different skip parts of your skill set. Um, you know, when you have, let's say, less resources available over a longer period of time versus more resources available in a shorter period of time, which is, I think, the, the fundamental economic difference. You really just got to be smarter about how you're managing them 
Um, and you've got to, as a, as a leader in those circumstances, really be clear about purpose, expectations, and priorities. And I think that if you can align those three things in a really concise and clear way, then it allows you to be able to flex, whether you're in a corporate setting or an academic setting or, re or regional setting, what doesn't really matter the setting you're in, but if you can align purpose, expectations, and priorities, then you're able to really drive those resources in a smart and targeted way. Excellent. Shannon. So I work with a summer academic uh, program as opposed to a year round academic program. So I'm not involved with direct teaching of students. However, you know, everyone is learning. Um, they are learning on the job and that's going to be very different than what they would be doing uh, in the professional world. Although we are always learning, um, but I know that everyone may have different levels of skill when, uh, when they work with us. And my goal and my purpose is to help them along with their journey. And, you know, that's part of the, the awesome part of it. And also letting them know that even as a professional, they will continue to learn and to grow, whether they continue to do theater or not. Excellent. And Cody. Yeah, I agree with uh, everything that's been said. I think uh, the biggest difference is, yes, is resources. The more money you have, the more resources you have. I also think that this, uh, going back to what Danielle was saying, uh, the, the, the different um, mediums that you're in, the stakes are higher. I get, you know what I mean? So like, for whatever reason, you're throwing more money at it, the stakes seems a little bit higher. So you feel like you can't, um, you don't have that grace to make a mistake, um, which is a whole nother conversation. Um, but I do, I do find that in certain, um, in certain uh, projects that I work on. Um, the other thing that, that I think is uh, uh, quite different um, for, especially for young uh, people of color is accessibility. A lot of people don't necessarily um, have access to certain schools. They don't have access to certain Broadway jobs. They don't have access to certain regional theaters. Um, so I think that is uh, a huge, a huge thing, uh, a big, Thing and the difference from the three, like sometimes the, uh, the access to regional theater may look very different um, from the access to you know, job Broadway or even off Broadway. Uh, just New York in general, I think the access to getting jobs in New York is very different than when I was in St. Louis working for the rep or the muni. Um, so that's, a, um, so that's a, a, a something that I've noticed along the way as well. I think you're 100% correct about the access. I think access uh, looks different depending on, you know, quite frankly, what you look like and the opportunities that you've had, uh, as well as, you know, who you are privileged to know or not know. And I think one of the things that this great pause uh, will hopefully lend itself to is creating more access uh, to the folks who are looking for opportunities, right? And what, of which we know there are many and, and great. There's this myth about in our industry that um, they can't find, you know, BIPOC folks because um, there aren't any working in the industry, but you know, there is, there is no truth to that. And we all know that they exist. Uh, we just need to adjust where we look. So I am 100% uh, on board with the idea of access and increasing that access to uh, a wide ranging of, of, of people. So thank you for that. We are we're not, not hiding. hiding. <laughs> we're here in place. Uh, one thing I wanted to uh, sort of tennis ball back to something you all brought up was this idea of resources. Uh, and so one question I would have is as you uh, either scale up or scale down, depending on the industry you're working in, how does the increasing of resources uh, change the expectations? Is there a greater expectation that the art is, is, is quote unquote greater than or more than because you have um, more resources or is the expectation that you will do what you can given the resources on hand. I don't, I think the, oh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, um, I would say, I don't, I don't think that just because you have more resources, you have more, you know, tools in your toolbox, you're going to make better art. You know, some people can make something incredible with a sheet of paper and, you know, a pencil, you know, so I, I mean, I, I necessarily wouldn't put that expectation on having more money and more, tools to access better art. I do think that it, it um, you know, the more resources, the more f funding, the more money you have, um, the more, uh, the, the wider spread you can make it, you know, the more people are gonna have access to it. So I think that in that regard, people may look at it as, 
you know, a higher art form because it's it's more widely available. Um, but I do, I think resources just kind of gives you a little bit more freedom to work. You know, when you're in an environment where you have limited resources, you're gonna feel a little bit pigeonholed with trying to create certain art. If you're in a, a, an environment where they're giving you the world and more, you have a little bit more freedom to, to, to do what you want, um, which also comes with, you know, all the other things that, that comes with. But um, but I personally wouldn't wouldn't you know say that you know the more money, the more resources, the more tools, the artist better. Very well said, Brian. You have something you want to add to the? Yeah, I mean, I I can sort of draw a little bit of a direct line, and and this weird pandemic moment has has sharpened this thought for me of like the what's the income side of it, right? Because there's generally a, the expectation is, right, the more money that's going into the thing, the better the thing is going to be, the more money we're gonna make off of the thing, right? Whether that's corporate or nonprofit or Broadway or all, like, it doesn't really matter where you are, that's been the general thinking. But I think what we're discovering is, right, like we can spend $20,000 to make a movie that can sort of run you know, infinitely, we can capture something in a really interesting way and probably make the same amount off of that than if we spent, you know, 150,000 on the big, you know, Christmas Carol that we would, would normally do. So I do think that, that yes, there's a pressure that's there, but I'm, what I'm challenging sort of the, the, the income side of the, the business on constantly is like, we have to think about the, the bang for our buck and, saying just because a show we're going to put in a studio theater and it's going to be it's going to be a smaller audience uh doesn't mean that we need to invest less in that show as an ec as an economic exercise absolutely you're going to make less money on that show so you you want to put less money into it so you can recoup whatever but there's a little bit of binary thinking i think that has its roots in white supremacy that has crept into the economic modeling and that's where that pressure starts to come from. So dismantling that is a really high priority because until you dismantle the binary thinking about resources in, resources out, um, then we're gonna be stuck in the same pattern of the more money, the more pressure, the more pressure, the less access, the less access, the less representation, which is where we are now. I don't think I could say it any better than that. Uh, Stu, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I, I, it's one of those things when I when I was at the Guthrie that uh, the Guthrie, from what I was told, uh, I don't know if this was true or not, is that the Guthrie was known for its production values and not necessarily for its acting uh, cap prowess. Uh, and Joe Haas set to to change that, and that was one of the things that he and I clicked on. I was like, there, the the production, the physical production is there to support the story. It should not be the story. So I'd rather actually scale back the physical production and put my resources into human beings. Again, to what you said earlier, Larry, centering the human being. If I can make my my staff's life easier and a little bit more fruitful, the art is going to be better exponentially because if they feel seen, valued, heard, that they can heal within the organization and don't have to lead the organization in which to heal, your product is going to be exponentially better. Um, I can throw lumber into the dumpster and that investment goes away. That is short-lived. If I reinvest in the people and I, I can retain them, the investment is better off. So I do think that higher resources can lead to a more uh, can lead to better art. Um, and I don't think you have to be a 30 million or a $600 billion organization to do that. I think it's about, you know, uh, economy of scale and investing in, you know, centering of the humanities with your, your resources. Excellently said. Thank you for that. Uh, so with that in mind, one question I would like to pose to our esteemed panel, if you had the power, carte blanche, to change one thing in our industry or your industry with which you work, what would that one thing be and why? Give you a second to think about it. And then we will start with D. Um, as I said before, I'm a big fan of education. Um, I, if, 
I mean, it's more of a mindset than it is like if you threw money at it, it could ultimately be fixed. But the ability to know that you can make an error, to make a mistake and know that you can grow from it, that you can learn from it, that that it doesn't have to be a make or a break. And I think that's that's that was one of my struggles as not just being the first I when I did my internship, I was not just the first stage, you know, I wasn't a first female stage manager, but being an African American woman, I feel like I had to work even harder because I did not want to make a mistake. I didn't want to seem like a failure. I felt like I was put more on a pedestal. And I feel that a lot of people don't take chances in their field because they feel like if you just mess up once, you're never going to make it. And it's just not true. If I had the power, I would use as much money as possible to get people who want to do theater, whether you want to be on stage, backstage, around the stage, whatever it was, to realize that we could educate you. We can make you feel like an error doesn't mean it's a failure. An error just means you're learned from it because that it's the same thing as an apology or learned behavior. If you keep making the mistake, it doesn't mean you're learning from it. You have to make it, learn it, grow from it, and then pass that lesson on to someone else. So again, I don't think it's anything that you could throw money at, but more of an experience. If anything, I'd love to be able to give more experiences to more BIPOC, um, whether you want to be on stage, but mostly backstage because we're just as important. We we make the magic. It doesn't. We don't always have to be in front to make a difference. I'm, I'm very happy where I am. I'm not hiding in the dark. As I said before, I'm very proud of my position, not just as an African-American, but as an African-American female. Thank you for that. You know, I think one of the things you touched on is very important to um, highlight is that, you know, in the theater industry, you know, BIPOC folks are seen as a monolith, right? So when one fails, we all fail collectively, uh, which is the same for, you know, some of our white counterparts, right? So being able to to grow and learn individually is is huge in our industry. So I very much agree with that. Thank you for that, D. Uh, Cody. Yeah, um, I agree wholeheartedly. I think we have to, you know, debunk this thing about being per, uh, a perfectionist. Um, but uh, I guess I'll just say, and I say this all the time, um, if I could change one thing, it's these, we need to have five day work weeks and we need to do away with 10 out of 12s. You know, that's the thing of the past. We don't have to work those hours all the time. So I think there's definitely ways to figure that out in the American theater. Television has figured it out, you know, and they get paid a lot more. So I do think that there's a way that we can figure this out in the theaters for people, families, people who are raising kids. You know, I think that is a very easy and tangible step to showing people that they care about their time. Um, so five day work weeks, two days off. And Excellent. So if I could piggyback on that as well, learning self-care as Cody was saying, like we have to have to learn it. We are, I'm still in that mindset of like, I have to do six days. I have to do my 10 out of 12 when it's just, it, I don't know why it's such an impossible concept, but it is something that should be pushed about self-care. We can't give the best, we can't be our best and still fear we're making a mistake if we're not taking care of ourselves. That has to be first and foremost. And as a new mom, it's still not even a concept to me because we had not seen that concept yet of being able to see this new world with these new guidelines, being able to take care of ourselves, then work. So, sorry. Very well said. Thank you for that. No, no, no. Shannon. You know, if I could change one thing, it would be the gift of time. Um, and that's, you know, and also the gift of time, not at the expense of anyone. So, you know, like was said, you know, two day weekends, five day work weeks, uh, shorter tech times because you know we're burning people out so people need time for their personal self and self-care but also giving artists more time we do changeover so quickly we move from one show to the other so quickly there's not as much time as everyone truly needs and it could be spread out more excellent these two oh i have all the things um one, I wish that we didn't have to have Edie and I conversations. I wish I was just gone. I wish that we were all seen, valued, heard um, in what we do in our profession. And we didn't have to have these conversations about representation and that we had respect in there. And the other one was that I, I wish that the arts were nationally respected and we were compensated as such. Um, I mean, the one thing, the thing that got, I would say, the majority of 
the world, the country, if not the world, was entertainment. You know, all we heard was about binging, 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 binging. And that's entertainment. That's us. That's what we do. Whether we're in front of the camera or behind the camera, uh, we were the ones, we were the lifelines to the world. And I think that is an, we are severe, especially here in the United States, severely underappreciated in what it is we do. Heard. 100% heard. And Brian. Um, yeah, I actually, I want to go back to this five day work week and 10 out of 12 thing in a second. But um, the thing I would change is I wish that we could be more, we could have a more collegiate system. Um, you know, I, I wish I could know how another director of production is doing their job on a daily basis um, without swapping emails back and forth about it. I wish that there was a way that I could get into all, there's so much knowledge and energy and passion and lived experience that exists within the industry i wish that there was a way that i could i could sort of just tap that and 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 in an instant know like hey this is how this person has solved this problem this is how they tackle this at this institution and here's the practical ways that they've done it and here's how d stew runs the most amazing production meeting in the world like i'd love to just instantly be able to know that um, and I think that, that that would be so powerful for so many areas of, of theater. I think every designer wishes that. I mean, there's that famous quote from whichever director I can't remember that says, you know, directing is like having sex. You only know about it with the person that you're doing it with, right? So like everybody wants those type of shared learnings. Everybody wants that type of access to information. And quickly on the five day work week and the 10 out of 12 thing, um, we actually have just implemented that at Dallas Theater Center, and we also just happened to have had our postmortem today, um, and it was a huge topic from, from our staff and from our department heads. And one of the surprising insights that came out of that that I wasn't really thinking about was that folks thought that besides being happier and being healthier and having a much better work-life blend, they thought that their problem solving during tech was better. They thought they were more concise. They thought that they were actually doing better work because we weren't slapping Band-Aid solutions on things at the beginning of the day, knowing we're going to get to it in, in 12 hours. People were just getting together, solving problems, moving on, and we solved it in a really, really clear and concise way. So I think that there's a strong business case that is being made. We are learning those things actively at Dallas Theater Center. And I'm going to keep putting those learnings out into the universe as much as possible so everybody can start adapting those practices. Because what we're learning so far is they really work. You know, what, I, what I'm what i hearing this esteemed panel talk about over and over again and seem to have proof of concept is when you center humanity and the human, uh, your product gets better, your workplace gets better, and it exponentially um, increases everything in the positive and not the negative. And so I would say to the folks watching, if you pull nothing away from this centering uh, the human and humanity seems to be a great place to start. Um, so one of the uh, last things we want to get into as we are getting ready to wrap up our time here is if you all could give one piece of advice to someone coming up in the industry who want to either follow in your footsteps or to uh, begin the career of their own in management, uh, what is one piece of advice that you would give them and or what is one piece of advice that you wish you would receive uh, as you were coming up in the industry? Uh, we'll start with Dave Stewart. Sure. Uh, I think, and unfortunately, Akeem couldn't join us due to technical difficulties, but I'm going to quote something he said when we were riffing uh, and working on this session is about seeking counsel. Uh, one of the things I said when we were putting this panel together and, and talking behind the scenes was, I wish I had this counsel, this group of, of people to sit there and go, am I crazy? What's going on? Can I get the help? Um, kind of what Brian is saying, but kind of in that that um, communal way, because it's hard being the first and the only, and then feeling like you have to be perfect um, because you have to be, you know, uh, work twice as hard to be seen as half as good in, in some of these instances. Um, so I think that the, what I would tell folks is to look into your network, make sure you keep a, 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 a tribe around you, and um, and really kind of lean on those folks, really kind of do that that lean in to folks and don't be afraid of those things. That's one of the things that uh, I, I struggled with when I was at the Guthrie is that feeling that I had to have all the answers and I had to be perfect. 
And that changed for me when I got to Disney. I'm like, oh, I can ask really stupid questions here and not made to feel stupid asking those questions. Thank you for that. Shannon. You know, um, my career in theater actually started working in HR and I got to meet everyone in the theater because they would come in to do benefits or payroll or what have you. And advice that I would give to every theater artist is don't silo yourself into your own department. If you work in production, make sure you're meeting people who work in development and work in marketing and vice versa, because there's so much that we can learn from each other. And especially if you are interested in working in theater management, you need to have an understanding and a relationship with everyone in the building, everyone in your space. So make sure you meet everyone. Excellent. Cody. Um, I feel like this, the, the advice that I would give to my younger self changes all the time. Um, but right now I would say, you know, don't forget about the things that you enjoy when, when doing theater, you know, hold on to those moments that you love and, and keep checking in with yourself and making sure that you are still loving art for doing. Um, the other thing that I would say to, you know, younger generations, I guess, who want to enter this field, um, is to just remember that, you know, you can do this. You know, I'd say it all the time. If I can figure out how to do this from where I come from, you can do this. You can make it happen. So, so if it's meant for you, it will happen. So just stay persistent, keep working hard, keep connecting, use your resources and know that you can do this. Don't ever doubt your ability. Excellent. Uh, I want to add to something Cody said in our offline chat um, that he didn't bring up today. This must be that ever evolving uh, advice he's talking about. Uh, but one thing he said to me that really stuck with me since our last conversation is uh, you belong in every room that you're in. I think there is a, a sense of imposter syndrome that goes around, especially with BIPOC folks, uh, feeling like we don't belong uh, not only at the room, but maybe at the table. And so having that sense of self having that counsel that Dee Stewart is talking about and really knowing and owning and believing that you belong in every room that you're in uh, is, is to me profound. And so um, I wanted just to put that into the space for folks because I thought that that was fundamentally uh, brilliant and something I hadn't really heard or, or heard in that way. So uh, thank you for that offline and put you on the spot a little bit, Cody, sorry about that. Uh, Dee. <laughs> Uh, piece of advice I have, um, it sounds really cheesy. I heard it on a sitcom, but since I heard it, it stuck with me. It stuck with me every day with my career is anything worth having is worth fighting for. Um, you know, we kind of come into entertainment, at least when I came into it, I said, I was going to be an actor and I'm going to start from here. You don't always start at the top. You're going to be at the bottom for a little bit, but that doesn't mean that you can't climb. Climbing is the best part because it makes you humble. It makes you appreciate where you came from and appreciate the things that are to come. But also, and I'm trying to remember what I was saying before, um, it just makes you appreciate your journey. I, you know, someone saw something in me and wanted to see more of it and I just wanted to give it. So just because it's hard doesn't mean it's not worth doing. It's going to be so exciting in the end. It's going to be so for it, it I, I can't explain it. It's the most cheesiest thing I can say, but as long as you keep fighting for it and you appreciate it, it's gonna be the greatest thing that comes your way. Excellent. And Brian. Yeah, for me, it's about uh, act be not being afraid to activate your network. And it kind of goes into this idea of having sort of a, a, a council that you can go to um, you know, I, I, just, I specifically remember the point in my career when I had the aha moment that said, oh, wait, this is how everybody's getting ahead. This is how these other folks, usually white folks, but these other folks, this is how they're getting the jobs. This is how they're getting in the rooms. This is how they're, how they're, they're getting the promotions and getting the raises. Um, and that was because they were leveraging their network. They were not afraid to go to a Tony award-winning designer and say to that designer, hey, can you be a reference for me? Or hey, can you call this person up? And when I had that light bulb to go off, my career took off, it was rocket fuel. So that's the advice I'd give my younger self. And that's the advice I give to any particularly young um, person that is, that is consuming this is, 
you know, you should you should be calling up everybody that you know in a position of power um, or influence and and using those contacts. I'm happy to do it for other people. It's your it's it's not a burden. I'm I'm happy to clear obstacles and open doors and to help folks and to coach you on your resume or coach you through an interview. I mean, that's that's what um, that that is how you once you've broken through whatever ceiling or through every door, you don't pull the ladder up after you. And I think that there's been um, a real awakening, particularly in a lot of BIFOC folks, where we are, we are coming together now to do more of that. So use that network, leverage it, and don't be afraid to reach out. Excellent, excellent. Can I, can I add one more thing? Sorry, I remember the yeah. other part. Um, it's one of the things that I, I implement when I'm stage managing, like if something's wrong on stage and we can all identify that there's something wrong, it's just the same thing with your career. You can identify that, oh, I didn't get this job. Oh, I didn't get this thing. I didn't get, I didn't do what I wanted to do. You, you can always identify what is wrong. Focus on what you can do right. Focus on what can make a difference in that situation. You may not have gotten the internship you wanted. You may not have been able to to have that show that you wanted, but realize that there is something positive for you to focus on. There is something for you to put your energy into and move forward that way. There's no sense in wasting your time focusing on what you can't do. Let's focus on what you can do. And it's so much greater than you think it is. Thank you. Excellent. Very well said. Thank you for that. Uh, as we wrap up, before we wrap up, I want to give everyone an opportunity. If there is a project you would like to plug, or something to keep an eye out on? Does anybody have anything they would like to shout out to the masses? There's always an internship. There's an internship every year at Baltimore Center Stage. So make sure that you apply yourself. The worst answer is the one that says no and the one that you don't give yourself an opportunity of. I will quickly plug, I'm right after this, I'm actually going into another panel for the uh, Broadway and Beyond Access panel which I'm really excited about of, you know, being in rooms with like 75 stage managers of color. It goes back to this whole thing of like, the talent isn't there, the talent is there and the talent is not hiding. And now the obstacle has been completely removed for folks to say the talent isn't there. So I'm thrilled to be going into that panel and getting a chance to meet these folks and interview them and figure out ways to bring them into uh, institutions that have um, been predominantly white. And I think we need more and more and more of that sort of thing. Excellent. Ooh, Brian, I'm going there too, so be nice to me when I go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will say that we at the Repertory Theater of St. Louis uh, have a virtual program called Cookings, Carols, and Cocktails. It is on our website where you can watch uh, famous chefs from around the city of St. Louis cook some of their famous dishes, and you can cook alongside them or watch the episode and or enjoy some um, Carols that will be musical interludes as well as the signature cocktail. So if you go to uh, our website, you will be able to find uh, more information on that, cookings, carols, and cocktails. With that, I want to say thank you to our panelists. You all are amazing human beings in your personal and professional lives. And I am honored to have shared the room with you uh, and been to spend this last you know, 65, 70, 75 minutes with you uh, just learning and communing and giving some great information and insight to uh, all the folks who are watching. And on behalf of everyone listening, uh, excuse me, on behalf of everyone listening and everyone at USATT, uh, we'd like to thank our guests again for providing the space for these conversations. Uh, if you want more conversations and many others like these as a part of our equity, diversity, and inclusion work, this work is supported by the Tanisha Jefferson Fund through USITT. If you would like to make a gift of support, you can find that at usitt.org slash donate. Again, thank you all for your time and happy holidays.